welcome to Job Talk with SP Jane School of Global Management. I'm Dr. CJ, your host, and we're broadcasting from the Live Your Dreams department at SP Jane's Singapore campus. This is your chance to ask questions about your jobs, work, careers, and life mission. So if you have work-related questions or problems on any topic, doesn't have to be today's theme, just type it into the LinkedIn comments field and our secret moderator will pass it to us. We'll either help you solve your problem or at least help you laugh and know you're not alone. My guest today is Rick Smolin, million view TED speaker, actually 1.4 million, Time Life National Geographic photographer, record-breaking best-selling author and publisher, and CEO of Against All Odds. Our theme for, the today, for today is do what you love against all odds. Thank you for joining us, Rick. Nice to be here. It's nice to see you again, CJ. And in a break with tradition, we're not going to lay any foundation for our topic with did you knows or notable news because Rick's life is far more interesting than anything I would dig up for you on Google. Before asking his first question, I just want to share this hefty tome the human face of big data. I don't know if it's available anymore, um, it's but it's one. Yeah, it is oh, awesome, awesome. I'm proud, proud, proud to show off my copy that Rick gave me um, with some incredible photographs and some really great conversation starters about emergent intelligence that's coming out of the internet and the human face of that. So Rick gave me that book right after I interviewed him as part of my book, it's it's a lot smaller, uh, but it's kind of hefty too. Um, Innovation through fusion. So if you want to hear more about Rick, if you'd like to read more, um, he is a whole chapter in that book as well. Thank you for that. So <laughs> welcome, Rick. And I, I've, we've got an audience of young professionals, MBAs, a whole lot of people who are interested in careers. Mm -hmm. So I got to ask you, super successful guy. So you started out life super successful in school, straight A, great <laughs> student, right? Not, not exactly. <laughs> I uh, had a D minus average. Uh, I don't know how I ever got into college. Uh, four high schools in four years. Um, I was uh, bored out of my mind. Um, and uh, they would test me and say that I had a high IQ, but terrible grades. And um, I was just out of school. It just wasn't for me. Uh, now I now I look back and think the the opportunity to be around really smart people and not take advantage of it to just kind of do it as little as possible. I, I want to yell at myself back then and say you're such an idiot. Like there, you had all these people you could have learned from, and you and you kind of just kind of phoned it in. But um, all I wanted to be since I was uh, basically my dad gave me a camera when I was 16. I was very shy, and uh, um. I always thought when other people were born, everybody in their toolkit had something that taught them how to relate to other people, how to strike up a conversation with a stranger, how to talk to girls. And that was all left out of my toolkit. I, I, I was totally, I was panicked. The idea of standing up in front of my classroom, I would have, you know, I couldn't sleep for three days before that if I had a good presentation. So when my dad gave me a camera, all of a sudden I found it was like my magic carpet. I, I could talk to anybody. People liked to have me there. I, it was an excuse for me to insert myself into different groups. Um, and people liked having me there because I made them look good, even though I wasn't a very good photographer. At the beginning, you know, I, people love having, you know, people like to be the subject of the story. So um, I told my dad I wanted to go and be a photographer. And he said, under no way you're going to be a photographer. You're going to be a doctor or a lawyer. Like most, you know, parents, they want you to earn a living. And, um, you know, my father, my father said, that being a photographer is doing wedding portraits and baby pictures, and I'm not spending the money to send you to college to do that. Um, and so he wouldn't let me go to any any university with a, a photography program. So I went to my art professor the first week I was in college, and um, I asked him if I could create my own major, which no one had ever done before. And he said, "In what?" And he said, "In photography." And he said, "Okay." So within a week, I was doing what I wanted to do, much to my father's quite. Uh, he was quite upset about it. Um, so I did the yearbook of the newspaper and uh, my dad said, 
you know, I kept saying I want to work for National Geographic or Time Magazine, and my dad said, "You're like so. You never finish anything. You have a D minus average. You're completely scatterbrained." Uh, you know, he, every he teacher, was your he was your big cheerleader, right? I mean, well, I mean, I you know, parents have different ways of of um, of trying to help their kids, and my dad mm -hmm. was very you know he would just give me honest feedback. He thought by being critical that I would then respond to the criticism, but maybe it's a challenge. Um, yeah, whatever it was. Um, in any case, his his mental picture of the way the world worked is you would you would work your way up over many years, over decades, to where you could work for one of, one of the leading publications in the world. So I took my yearbook to Time Magazine, and um, basically got hired. Uh, you know, the, the, it turned out there was a, the, the the main director of photography there. I didn't know this at the time, but he had a reputation of looking for one young hungry photographer every year and throwing them out in the middle of the lake, just giving them assignments they had no ability. I mean, I had never even shot color pictures. I only shot black and white pictures of my friends oh, wow. for the yearbook. So um, he basically just started giving me jobs I had no right to get. And every job I got, and I'm sure uh, a lot of the, your audience listening to this can relate to this, but I would go, I would get an assignment from Time Magazine or other magazines. I was a freelancer. And I would go from, oh my God, this is so cool. I got an assignment for Time Magazine to, oh shit, they're gonna find out that I'm an imposter, that I that this will be the end uh. of my career. I have no idea what I'm doing, I'm gonna screw it up. And so it was always this roller coaster of like this high of, oh my God, I got an assignment to, oh my God, my world, th this will be the end of my entire, I'm gonna screw it up and they'll never hire me again. And it turns out, I didn't know this at the time, but I'm an adrenaline junkie. So when I'm terrified, I'm actually much better. When I'm confident, oh, it's usually wow. when I screw it up. So that's that's how my sort of career got started. So did they did they ever give you any choice in the assignments that you were? I mean, how did, if if you were trying new things that you'd never done before, how did you know when to say yes and when to say no? Well, first of all, you never say no, right? because first of all, you know, you never know whatever the assignment sounds like. It is it's often quite different once you get there. Oh. Um, and um, yeah. I'll, gi I'll, I'll give you an example. My first cover story for Time Magazine, I was 24 years old, and mm -hmm. I was uh, assigned to photograph a woman named uh, Sarah Caldwell, a very famous opera conductor. And uh, Sarah, I didn't know this, but she ate photographers alive. She hated being photographed. She was quite overweight, uh, and she didn't, I don't think she liked the way she looked, and so she hated photographers. But she was very famous, so, so magazines were always sending her to be photographed. So um, I knew for a week I was going to be going to Boston to photograph her. And all week I had uh, the um, opportunity to turn to my other photographer friends and ask them to teach me how to light because I didn't know how to light. I didn't know how to put lights around, you know, and, and light somebody like for a portrait. And I, I'm sort of in denial. So I, I thought, well, when I get to Boston, I'll take her outside and I'll look for open shade you know, where, the, where, the, where she's in the shade, but there's a bright light. Like oh, yeah, in sunny light. Boston. Yes, right. Okay. Yeah. Well, this was the problem. Middle of winter, so I. I, I, they I don't. They, there aren't any shadows in Boston for about three months. Well, usually I was able to somehow work things out, but this day it was miserably wet and rainy and dark and overcast. And so I got to her house, and I knocked on the door, and she let me in reluctantly. And she had her house was so badly lit inside; it was like fifteen watt light bulbs. The house was like walking into like a haunted house and her mother was in a wheelchair. And, um, and so I tried taking pictures of her and, you know, I knew I was completely blowing the whole thing. This is my first cover story and my, again, this opportunity, I had all week to prepare for this. And she was really irritated. When are you, are you done? Are you done? You know, how much more time do you need? And, uh, I was just sinking in this terrible depression because every time I pushed the shutter, I knew this was a terrible photograph. It was blurry. It was the lighting was horrible. It was just I was really ready to shoot myself. And there was a knock on the door, and she said, "Could you go ahead and answer the door, please?" Very annoyed, just she can't wait for me to leave. And I opened the door, and it's a CBS film crew that's come to take to do a documentary about her. And they come in, they light they light her entire house. <laughs> it's like, oh my god! That's like it's like. Had, had, and so I'm trying to be really quiet. I'm trying to hide behind their film crews so she doesn't notice I'm still there. And I'm shooting over their shoulders. And of course, they're getting annoyed because I'm, you know, click, 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 and they're trying to interview her. I remember that they put gaffer's tape on the, on her wall and ripped off some of the um, the wallpaper. And they almost knocked her mother out of the wheelchair twice, trying to move her mother in the wheelchair out of the way. And they, 
they were so awful. The, this crew was just, they were so rude. I mean, it was not the guy doing the interview, but all these people ran. So when they left, I was still there in the corner, not <sighs> being able to believe my luck. And I remember she looked over and said, are you still here? And I said, yes, um, I'll, I'll get out of here. And she said, have you ever shot a time cover story before? And I said, no, actually, this is my first job. And she, I always looked 10 years younger than I was. So when I was 24, I looked like I was 16 years old. And so she said, do you want some milk and cookies? I mean, she felt sorry for me. I, I mean, I literally, I looked like a little forlorn kid. And uh, I heard her on the phone while I was eating my milk and cookies. And she was trying to order. So uh, there really were milk and cookies. She gave me milk and cookies. And, and I, I was so relieved that, like, I thought some of those pictures probably came out okay. Uh, I wasn't directing her. I was just, like, shooting over the shoulder of the film crew. So she got on the phone, and she was trying to order a, a car to pick her up and drive her to New Hampshire from Boston. And she was really irritated because they said she was calling too late. They couldn't drive her. And I said, um, I just, I don't mean to be eavesdropping, but I heard you on the phone. C could I rent a car and be your driver? I'll drive you to New Hampshire. And she said, what? She, that I think that's what she said. Have you have you ever shot a time cover story before? Like, why would you be my driver? And I said, well, I don't feel like I've really captured your personality. I, you know, I was shooting over their shoulders, and the lights not very good. And and she said, so you're just going to drive me to New Hampshire. And I said, well, I, then can I like hang around and photograph why you? And she said, uh, you know, she said, you know, the Beatles song, "Baby, You Can Drive My Car." And she said, if you want to be my driver, yes, you can drive me. So I actually ended up spending a week with her, and then she a decided week. to, and then she decided to go to Mexico. And she said, do you want to come to Mexico with me? So time was ecstatic because they thought I was going to get, you know, in two hours, they thought she'd eat me alive and spit me out. They actually, it actually was a test. They knew that she hated photographers and they thought this was going to be this kid getting, you know, this is a test and throw Rick away and try the next photographer. So I ended up spending an entire week with her in, in on, you know, on assignment. And uh, the cover story was, it was, you know, they were, they were delighted. And I had pictures, she liked the pictures, much everybody's astonishment. But it, it like, can you imagine, if that film crew hadn't shown up. So my whole life has been like that. It's just, I always feel like every time, every time something's about to go disaster, some miraculous thing happens. And I, that's why I can't count on it. I don't feel like it, I don't feel like it's me. I feel like it's some karmic thing that I, I'm going to have to pay for down the line somewhere. Oh my gosh. Well, now one of the, so, one of the things that you're best known for, um, once you had, had taken these jobs, time, life national geographic can you can you tell us where a day in the life series came from because that was your series how, so did that, was, how did that begin so you know as i said i was so lucky to have gotten started with no never studying photography so um by the time i was um about 30 um i shot i think six covers of time the cover of national geographic covers of magazines i was a freelance i never had a steady job for any magazine but um, it's funny, CJ, uh, my, um, roommate in college was a much better photographer than me. We were both into photography in college, but he hated not knowing what was going to happen next. He, he needed a, a steady job where he went every day to the same office and they told him, this is your job. And I, for me, that was, that was claustrophobia. I love never, never knowing what was going to happen next. And so when people gave me assignments, they always felt like mission impossible. It's like, you know, people would call me and say, can you be on, can you be in Bangkok in 24 hours? What's the assignment? Oh, you meet the writer at the Hilton Hotel. He'll fill you in on your mark and said, go. Nothing in writing. Sounds like um, James you, Bond. Wow. You know, that, that's, I mean, it was so cool. Man, and I was a kid. So, you know, my whole life was like that for from 24 to 30. So every time I, and I was always about 10 years younger than all the other photographers. So it was Eddie Adams who shot the you know, picture of street shooting in Saigon, Douglas Kirkland, who did the photographs of, um, Marilyn Monroe wrapped in a sheet, David Burnett, this extraordinary photographer, uh, just, you know, my heroes. And um, so we all formed, they, there was an agency, they invited me to join called Contact. It was like Magnum. Magnum is like the, the greatest photo agency in the world. And we were like a little mini Magnum. And we had like an Italian, uh, a Canadian, an Indian. We had like, it was like the United Nations. Anyway, um, every time I would hang out with these other photographers, every time there was a Pope visit or a typhoon or a war or whatever it was the same, basically hundred or so men and women would all descend from all over the world, representing all these different nationalities and publications. And then when we weren't shooting, first of all, I was always astonished how even people I was competing with would uh, share tips with me. 
or, or like, here's the home number of the American ambassador. If you get in trouble, don't go to this border because they'll x-ray your film. Um, here's a great guide when you're in Hanoi the next time. When you're actually shooting, it's every man and woman for themselves. But in between, it was this family. And But the other thing that, I, I, that kind of surprised me is they would all sit around in bars at night and bitch and moan and whine and complain endlessly. I hate this editor. I hate my magazine. I hate... And I said, you know, guys, this is like the coolest job in the world. Someone's paying us hundreds of dollars a day to fly around the world to meet prime ministers and to rent Learjets and and be the world's eyes. And you guys are whining. And they said, well, kid, once you're out here for a while, you'll understand. And I said, understand what? And they they said, we want our pictures to change the world. We want to we don't just want our pictures used as, you know, fodder in between the, the ads for deodorant. You know, we want our pictures to shock and to move people enough to try to change the things we're photograph, photographing and the things that we think need to be, you know, uh, put a spotlight on. So I said, well, I was, I was living in Australia at the time. And every time I mentioned Australia, all the photographers said, oh my God, what's it like? It's so cool. I want to go. You know, what are the girls like? What are the guys like? Whatever, you know, what's the landscape like? What's the light like? And so I said, well, you know, city, this is two in, two in the morning in a bar. We're all drinking. And I said, you know, what if, what if we did a project where like all of us, like hundred of us all went to Australia and we all spread out and we said, you know, on your market said, go, you got 24 hours to capture a day on film. So all my older, wiser uh, photographer friends said, yeah, kid, you go organize it and we'll all come thinking that would be the end of it. You know, late night conversation in the bar. And uh, I'm a little obsessive. Um, so I, I went out <laughs> sort of meeting. I, I went, I met, I met with we 35 met. publishers. Yes, we, yes, we met. You met. <laughs> So I went to 35 publishers who said, what a stupid idea. Like, who's going to, it's going to cost a million dollars to fly a bunch of your friends to some godforsaken country. Uh, nobody thought that much of Australia at the time. Now we all love it. Um, and so um, I went to the prime minister of Australia who I photographed. He was always very kind to me. And I got a meeting to see him. And I said, look, I want to, I want to do the Olympics of photography. I want to bring the best photographers in the world to your country. Now, I now, love Australia. Now, before we hear what the prime minister s- said, I have a quote that, that you gave me last time. You were turned down by 35 publishers, and the response was, who on earth would pay $40 for a book of pictures taken by you and your friends in some godforsaken country where nothing happens? Right, exactly. Um, and, and this followed a failure. Now, a, a, a Day in the Life started as one issue of magazine. Yeah, Life, Life Magazine did a day in life. Yeah, I'm sorry. I and and over did that, that issue, yeah. did that magazine issue really sparkle and it and it succeeded brilliantly? No, it didn't. In fact, I was the last, <coughs> excuse me, yeah. I was the last of the 100 photographers. Everybody hated hired. it. They didn't hate it. It just, it was, it was a cool idea. I was excited to have worked on it. But um, none of the farmers met each other. We all got assignments separately. The editors seemed to feel like every photographer needed to be in the magazine. In other words, if you got hired, they would put a picture of you in. So the whole pic, the whole magazine ended up being this sort of jumble of pictures crammed in. <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of uh, pictures that I don't think should have been in the, in the issue, and it didn't sell very well. So here I was, uh, you know, imitating their idea of something that didn't do very well in a yeah. country that other people didn't think would be very interesting. So um, <clears throat> no wonder all the publishers turned it down. Um, so, so, so um, you went to Australia's prime minister, Malcolm Fraser. Exactly, yep. He gave you a budget? <clears throat> uh, no, he did not. <laughs> I tried to get him to give me money, and he said, uh, I had actually been, I had been brought to Australia by the prime minister. I had met him in Japan on a Time magazine assignment, and he, it turned out the Australian government brought six journalists a year to Australia as their guest, and they would tour you around the country again because at the time Australia was feeling kind of left out at the bottom of the world, and and they were trying to you know, raise their visibility. So, I met the prime minister. He again, he was very unlike almost any pot- politician I ever met. He actually was interested in photographers and photography. He wanted to talk shop, mm-hmm. like what lens should I use? So, um, when I ended up working in Australia for National Geographic, I I I got to see him once or twice, and so I went to him this time and said, look. I'm trying to do this book about your country. I love Australia. You brought me here. Could you bring 100 photographers here the way you brought me? And he said, yeah, nice try. He said, we don't have that kind of budget. He said, but I'll help you. And I said, you know, don't be polite. He goes, no, I'm not being polite, but I don't have the budget. But here's my idea. He said, I'm going to set up meetings for you with the CEOs of Qantas, 
the CEO of Kodak, the CEO of, of Hyatt, um, of Hertz, this guy, Steve Jobs, starting this computer company. And I said, and why would I want to meet with a bunch of business people? And he said, Rick, you're going to ask them for free hotels and film and computers and, and computers. And I said, they're just going to give me all this stuff for free. And he says, yeah, because you're going to put your, their logo on the first page of your book. I said, I can't do that. I'm a journalist. He said, Rick, Rick, Rick. It's like a PBS special. It's like the following book is made possible through the generosity of the, of the, these companies. Right. So, um, you know, it was one of these things where I didn't realize that having the prime minister of Australia, um, uh, set up a meeting for you, the people were inclined to listen, you know, having it under his, you know, auspices, people at least were going to listen very seriously. So we, Steve Jobs gave us computers and um, we got uh, 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 first class tickets from Qantas Airlines, Hertz gave us cars. Um, uh, the, I didn't have any money, I couldn't raise any cash. So I said to the photographers, um, you know, I, I, can, I can bring you here, I can feed you, I can give you a car, but I can't pay you. If we ever make any money, we'll split, a th we'll give a third of anything we ever make. If we ever, people say there, there's no market for coffee table books, so don't, Get your hopes up, but everybody came, and it was Sebastian Salgado, and it was of course David Burnett, and Dino Goldberg, and, and uh, Douglas Kirkland. I mean, there's so many wonderful Eddie Adams. All these photographers have been my heroes growing up. Um, and and, and uh, this was a basic, and it was basically a new business model for yeah. publishing. Yeah, we couldn't, even, we didn't even have a publisher. I, even in Australia, that nobody would publish it. So um, I went to a, a local newspaper group down there, and I said, "Look, I'm doing this project." Um, uh, it's going to be a celebration of Australia. I knew it was their anniversary. It was like their 200th anniversary or something, whatever it was. And, uh, and they said, well, we'll only, we'll only uh, uh, sell the book uh, if you uh, agree not to, not to make it available in any bookstores for three months. And, of course, I couldn't get it into a bookstore. So it was like, don't throw me in the briar patch. They, in Australia, 5,000 copies of a book was a bestseller. They mm -hmm. bought, sight unseen, 60,000 copies of the book. It was insane. I mean, I was I was trying to keep a straight face because I knew how insane this was. And uh, again, I was afraid. You know, by the time it came to for them to sign the contract, they'd actually talk to somebody in publishing and say this is not a good business model. So two things happened, CJ. That again, I keep talking about my luck. First of all, uh, the newspaper group themselves, since they now owned sixty thousand copies of this book, they ran full page ads in color. They did television ads for the book. So they had this multi-million dollar ad campaign for a book, which no one had ever done before. And then each of the sponsors wanted to run ads saying, we're, we're so proud to be Kodak. We Kodak are the official film. We Qantas brought all the photographers here. So they started promoting it. Everybody had their own reason for the book to be a success. Um, so um, it became the number one book in Australia, which was insane. Um, I knew that we had a hit on our hands when one of the newspaper editors told me that so many people stole, people had to actually go to the newspaper to buy the book or order it through the mail. You couldn't go to a bookstore. So people would go to the newspaper and they had a, cop, a sample copy on like on the, the wherever they used to place uh, advertisements. There was, a, there was a desk you'd go to. So many people stole the sample copy that they drilled a hole through it and tied it to the desk. And when they came back from lunch one day, somebody <laughs> cut the rope and stole the book with a hole in it. With a hole so, in it. With a hole in it. I mean, it was it was insane. Uh, Australia actually has something. This is serious. Where they have every year, they have the most stolen book of the year according to bookstores. I don't know why that's a thing. Maybe because Australia started as a prison colony. I don't know. I love Australia. <laughs> It's a, the, the fact that there's actually an annual award, if you can imagine an award for most stolen book of the year. It's crazy. Um, and actually, Robin Davidson, uh, whose camel trip that I, I documented for National Geographic, she wrote a book on tracks, which also became the most stolen book of the year. So, um, so I, that I, is I, a I sort big of honor to be the most. Yeah. Very, if I remember very, correctly, how long did it take for those 60,000 books to sell out? Oh, it was about six weeks. It sold out almost immediately. And then we had a almost reprint. Absolutely. Um, it, it was crazy. And also, I want to say, by the way, um, uh, I'm not very good at confrontations. I mean, I, I, I think of myself as a nice guy, so I'm not, a very, I'm not very good when it comes to firing people. And um, I hired a guy who had won the award of best designer in Australia. 
I, I didn't know anything about design. My sister was a designer in the States, but I, I, I'm not a designer. And so I hired this guy and my sister, <laughs> Leslie, um, who ran a big design firm in New York called Carbone Smolen. I asked her if she'd fly to Japan and be on press with me while we were printing the book because I wanted somebody to say yes or no because I, I didn't know how to talk to the printers and that was her world. So she flew to Japan. We were still working on something called color separations back then. It's, it's sort of before you go to press, you have to tweak all the color. And my sister looked at the design of the book and she said, uh, you like the design? I said, what do you mean? She said, do you, do you like what the designer did? And I said, actually, I don't, I don't like it at all, but I'm a, not a designer. And she said, Rick, there's no grid. There's no, I mean, this is, it looks, it looked like the Life Magazine issue where everything just thrown in. Oh. And, uh, and she said, you know, we're supposed to go to press next week, but um, do you want me to try to redesign it? And so my sister redesigned the entire book, like on the fly. We, the Japanese were, had never seen this before because we were there to go on press. And here we are in the back room redesigning the entire book that's about to go on press. And uh, thank God she did it because it set it set the whole tone for all the day in life books that followed. I mean, she basically created the, the template that, and she did the first five or six books, and then you know we, we had other people working on them. But um, she said again, it, another example of somebody saving me from my own stupidity. You know. <clears throat> but you see, the thing is, you're the guy who says yes, gets into those situations, and has the humility to say, uh, uh, "Yeah, I'd love some help." Um, you know, hey, can I do this crazy thing like drive you around for a week? That that Australian book became the number one book in Australia, sold 250,000 copies, breaking every record in Australian publishing history. And, more, um, and, and very importantly, we sent a check for $1,000 to every photographer two years later. <clears throat> and they expected to get nothing. So, I mean, you know, I, I can't tell you how good it felt to spend $100,000 because no one never nobody ever expected they'd ever get paid for being part of it but it and it and interestingly i wanted to go back to being a photographer i didn't like the stress of trying to administer other people of firing this poor designer who had to tell him can you imagine the conversation i'm going to call this guy from japan and say um i don't know how to tell you this but um i've just thrown out your entire design and taken you off the book i mean you know, he'd spent two months designing it and of course i was the asshole i was the jerk you know but that you know that's what you know that's what a boss that is. comes in the territory that's right <clears throat> yeah you know you can't be liked all the time you know um, but you see now it, it, nobody knew if it was going to make any money did it was it always kind of a break-even proposition or you know did well, you take a financial hit for that <clears throat> um, i'm fighting a cold so i'm sorry for my voice here <clears throat> sorry to do all of that all no, i'm at talking. the end of it um <clears throat> At, at a certain point before the project went through, I wanted to call the whole thing off because when we weren't actually having much luck at the beginning raising money or raising finances or raising the sponsorship, but I had signed so many receipts for so many things that we'd spent along the way that I basically would have gone to jail. So I, it was like I couldn't back out. Uh, so it was like having somebody go, hold a gun to your head and say, make this book a bestseller or you're going to jail. Um, uh, so we, pay, we paid all the bills. It was it was very modestly profitable, very barely. Um, you know, we had never paid any of the staff. Everybody worked for free. Um, but I wanted to be. I wanted to go back to being a photographer. But um, the governor of Hawaii came to Australia on a visit and uh, stayed at the Hyatt Hotel, where had been our sponsor. And the Hyatt put our book in every room at the Hyatt since they'd been the sponsor. And the governor's office called us and said, our anniversary of statehood's coming up next year. Would you do a day in the life of Hawaii? So we did. And then uh, American Express called and said, um, we are fighting with the JCB credit card in Japan. Would you do a day in the life of Japan? And so it just took on a life of its own. I never went back to shooting. Basically, literally overnight, I went from being a photographer to being a producer, a director, a boss, none of which I would have been voted least likely to run anything in college <laughs> and high school. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I it, literally, it was, it was, yeah. by, it was really trial by fire. And again, when mm -hmm. I'm terrified, I tend to learn. And I, I, you know, again, I wish I could take credit for all this, but I, I feel like luck is 99% of my uh, success. And I keep wondering when it's going to run out, to be honest. 
you know. Well, Woody Allen said said famously, ninety percent of success is just showing up. That's true. You know, you're, yeah. the, you're the guy yeah. who shows up and and makes sure that it happens somehow. But you know, uh, about a dozen day of in the life books later, you decided you didn't want to do that anymore. Did you find a buyer for the brand or the company? Um, my halfway through the Australia project, um, there was a, a young guy who worked at a contact, our photo agency named David Cohen, uh, who is my best friend. And, uh, David came to Australia and really created order out of chaos. I mean, again, another example of somebody rescuing me from my own, um, you know, I, I, I'm good at starting things, but I also need other people to actually kind of figure out what are the valuable parts and, and what aren't. So David and I became partners on the day in the life books. And then, um, when, when we were struggling, everything was, we were real, things worked really well. But when we did a, a book called A Day in Life of America, um, I think the success went to both of our heads. And um, we started, there was started to have friction in our relationship. It got to the point where we just didn't like each other anymore, uh, which is really a shame because, you know, friendships are hard to come by. And we're actually good friends again now. But um, we just got to the point where neither one of us wanted to be around each other. And we just said, let's just sell the company. He wanted he wanted to run a company, so um, we sold the company to Rupert Murdoch. We actually met with Rupert Murdoch, um, and uh, we sold the company about uh, six months too soon. Uh, we were doing a book called A Day in Life of America. And, you know, I loved going to Japan and to Australia and to all these foreign countries. Doing A Day in Life of America to me, uh, to me, it was a bunch of unrelated anecdotes. I didn't get the book. I mean. Uh, but it turned out to be the number one book in the United States. It sold 1.2 oh. million copies. And so, two million. We were, we were 1.2 wow. million copies. Uh, it was a cover of Time Magazine. It was. It mean, literally people. There were like 300 people waiting in line to get their books autographed at the tattered bookstore in Denver. It, I, I never see anything like it. But because Dave and I were not getting along, <clears throat> we sold the company before the book came out, and we would have gotten triple probably what we got paid by Murdoch if we just waited six months. Um, but I also, I'd probably still be doing the life books now if I hadn't sold it. I mean, I, I was really tired of doing it. For me, it was the same problem solving in a different country. Then at first it was really exciting. And then by the ninth book, it was like, been there, done that. Um, you know, I know we're in a different country, but it felt like I wasn't, I didn't feel I was learning anything. And, I, and again, this friction between me and David was really unpleasant. And so um, I sold the company and my father, uh, who worked for a drug company. So, so wait a minute. But, but, so I, I think this is a really important moment that you came across that in the height of success, if you're not learning, if you're not growing, it really is time to stop it and do something else. And most people think, hey, you know, I need to get my, get my career moving up and achieve success and keep, keep a hold of the success as long as possible. So, um, it, you know, I, I think that's it's a good that lesson. Closet it's back to the claustrophobia thing I said at the beginning of the conversation. I, I, I don't like knowing what's going to happen next. I, I just get bored. I get, I get, you know, I've been offered jobs. Someone went, it wasn't actually, you. It wasn't authentic. Life, Life magazine once offered me to become director of photography at Life magazine, which was kind of ironic since that had been my start. Um, and at, at first I was excited. And then the whole idea of going to an office every day and, and that, I don't know, just the whole thing was like ah, claustrophobia. So the projects, in, the day of life projects also started feeling a little uh, repetitive, claustrophobic. And like, yeah. been there, done that. And uh, money was never the object of any of these things, not being a photographer and certainly not doing the day of life books. It was like a side effect. Um, <clears throat> and um, so, um, I, you know, I, I, I kind of, you know, floundered around for a little while. And then my father said, you know, why don't you do a day in the life of medicine? And I said, dad, I sold the name. And he said, I don't care what you call it. No, you didn't sell the ability to invite the best photographers in the world to focus on something instead of a country. Why don't you have them focus on medicine? I said, you know, a book about people in hospital beds, really? Who's going to buy that? He said, no, no, no. He said, if you realize how, the, if you see how much progress the human race is making towards um, learning how to heal itself, it's, it's so inspiring how fast, how much we're learning about the about the body, about medicine, about and he said you could also do it all over the world and you could show Ayurvedic medicine and and you know cupping in Finland and and you know uh, uh, acupuncture and so 
Um, it was insane that we raised five million dollars in three weeks from eleven drug companies. And I said, "Well, you know, we can only have one drug company." And my dad said, "No, no, so you can sell the, meta, the the pediatric edition and the cardiac the card what do you call it the you can basically take cardiology. Any one of the med- ca- cardiology yeah. thank you um, and find a different drug company that specializes in each of these." And it turns out and something I didn't know either. My father said. Um, each all these drug companies have something called drug reps where they call on the doctor and they say you should be using my version of this drug instead of my competitors and so the book became a, a way to get past the secretaries into the doctor's office and actually do face to face so like i want to give you this book but we need to i want to just you know give you the book and tell you a little bit about what we do and so uh, it was hugely successful it was the cover of newsweek um, i think it was 150,000 copies of the book, maybe I can't remember how many were printed, but it was, again, it was our first non-day in the life book, and it sort of set the mold for doing a deep instead of a broad look, uh, not generic, but a broad look at a country. Uh, my dad's idea was do a deep dive, and so after um, doing medicine, um, we did books on uh, the first um, the impact of the microprocessor on civilization in one day. Uh, we looked at the world of big data, the global water crisis. Um, uh, the first year of the internet, we, we, when the first year of the internet started, I, I just had this sense, this is going to change everything. So we had sent 150 photographers around the world and like, how do you photograph the internet? I mean, that, that was the fun thing of these projects is how do you take pictures of something abstract, like the internet or microprocessor, like what would you photograph or big data? Um, and that, and, and yet each of those books are actually very emotionally compelling. They are, they are, you know, it was, wasn't it Andy Grove? you had had a conversation with Andy Grove, the CEO of Intel, and that was the microprocessor, wasn't it? And then it was Marissa Mayer. Didn't she have a conversation with you at a TED conference where you were just kind of looking around for new ideas and she was Google employee number 20 and former CEO of Yahoo. And and it was her idea, wasn't it? The big data. Big data. Yeah. Yeah, Marissa is a wonderful friend. And uh, when she was at Google, she helped us so many times. She actually put us on the home page of Google. So every single person that went to Google to search. <laughs> there, was, there, was, there was a promotion there for a book we did called The Obama Time Capsule. And uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. she arranged for us to get. Uh, anyway, she, she was and is a really good friend. And uh, she was the one that said, you should look at big data. I said, what's that? And she said, well, a lot of us think we're watching the planet develop a nervous system and all of us with our smart devices, our phones and our little bands and, and uh, you know, watches and all the rest of it that we're like becoming sensors on this planet. And we can use that data to understand both ourselves, our bodies, and also the, the flow of traffic and the flow of money and the politics. And, and so we did this book, um, The Human Face of Big Data. And the model over the last couple of years has been instead of we do. We still sell books in bookstores, obviously, but um, a lot of the model has been to give the book to people that we think uh, it, it may have an impact on. So, so um, EMC, who was <clears throat> sorry, the sponsor of the book, actually gave um, sixty thousand copies of it on one day around the world uh, to world leaders and Fortune five hundred CEOs and celebrities. Now, wait a minute. Wait to- a minute. If I understand, if I remember correctly, that was your idea because you didn't want to just expose people to an idea you wanted to start a conversation well exactly and 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 uh emc was fantastic to work with uh, the other thing is that um we actually did a one-hour tv special my brother sandy so this is all in the family my sister's an incredible designer my brother sandy is a fantastic film director he does feature films and and vr films and documentaries so he he took all the work that we had all the research we'd done for the human face of big data and, and completely you came up with a completely fresh uh, look at it. They won the Boston Film Festival for um, best cinematography. It was broadcast in 30 countries. It's still available online. If you Google the human face of big data, <clears throat> people had stolen it and put it on, on YouTube. I don't care. I just want people to see it. Um, but again, these are all topics that don't sound like you could easily photograph them. And yet when you see the pictures, like the, you were holding up the picture. If you show, if you hold up the, really, the back really of the, hold, hold up the back. Yeah, that that picture. So, <clears throat> I don't know if your viewers can see it, but it's a baby lit by all the devices. In that now, you know, it's a camera, it's a cell phone, it's an iPad. Um, I love the picture. It looks like an old chiaroscuro painting. Brilliant! Absolutely brilliant. It's it's it, the whole book. 
I love how the photographers take the challenge of how do you humanize this abstract concept of something like uh, big data. Yeah, and, and it's it seems really, really <clears throat> important that I think one of the things that you taught me was when you were doing your photography as a journalist, you had access to incredible, incredibly important and powerful people across the globe, um, you know, like the, the prime minister of Australia and so forth. So whenever you get an idea, you're not shy about reaching out to people. You reached out to the CEO of FedEx, um, if I remember correctly, to, to FedEx all of these books out that EMC bought. And, and you, you rang up somebody you had met who founded an online bookstore. <laughs> yes, Jeff Bezos. <laughs> Jeff Bezos, yeah. So you're not shy about reaching out to people to make big dreams actually really happen. And if you had reached out to people in the center of organizations, they never would have happened. But you're reaching out to the top person with a big idea, and that's the person who then says, yeah, I want to join in, make it happen. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of people that don't return my calls. <laughs> and oh. that, that, you know, <laughs> obviously. Yeah, but if Jeff Bezos returns your call, that's that Steve Jobs. That's not bad. Marissa Meyer. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I met Jeff and his wife, uh, Mackenzie, a year before Amazon went public. And so I actually went up and visited them and, and spent a day looking. You know, he gave us a tour of their operation when Amazon had, like, um, doors on, on like, uh, uh, what are they called? Those? Anyway, the, 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 all the desks were made up sort of out of, out of old you know, doors and, and bookshelves and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. And so... What, Again, I'm not asking people to do something that's just good for me. When I approach somebody like Jeff or FedEx, I said, look, um, I want to send this book to the most important people in the world. Would, so Jeff, Amazon did all the packaging and FedEx covered all the shipping to send these books all over the world. The hardest part actually was, was figuring out who the, the most important people in the world were and getting their addresses and making sure it wasn't going to end up sitting in a, in a mail room somewhere afterwards. So Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. We've got three minutes left. Okay. I've got two quick questions. Um, and we've got one question from a listener. Um, the TED Talk, Story of a Girl. Um, I just have to ask you, how did that get 1.4 million views? What, what kind of marketing did you do? No, I didn't do any marketing at all. I mean, TED is TED. I mean, people just, you know, if people, it's word of mouth. A TED has chosen my talk a few times. If any of your... Um, uh, viewers are interested if you go to www.natashastory.com it takes you to the ted talk so her, her name is natasha so natashastory.com and it's about a um, 11 year old girl that i met when i was 28 years old doing a story about amerasian children children who had been fathered by american gis and abandoned and in the middle of the story uh, her grandmother who died uh, left her children a will and so i suddenly had this 11 year old and uh, it's a story of how my best friends uh, Gail and Jean Driscoll adopted her, but it's quite a quite a saga, and uh, we almost all died during it. And uh, it's a happy ending, but with lots of twists and turns. And uh, I was not married. I, but you know, I was, I was very immature at 28. I'm still immature, <laughs> as Natasha will tell you, and my wife will tell you, and my kids will tell you, and my aunt will tell you, and my sister will tell you. Um, but. Um, Somehow, uh, Natasha changed all of our lives. And so the story's a little, you think it's us trying to not, it, it sounds like us trying to rescue a little girl, but the girl actually changed all the lives of all the people that um, were around her. So, That's and beautiful. she's she's like, she's like my kid sister. Uh, so, so what we're seeing in your career experience is we're seeing you with an, with incredible social capital, very happy to reach out and, and, and grab people and, and put different people's work together, even if it's like a hundred different photographers on one piece of work. But you're also happy to listen and try and find the next thing. And that helps you create content that not only touches the mind, but also touches the heart. Um, question from listener and then one more question, then we're gonna have to go. But the question from the listener is how can one separate the feelings and emotions from difficult decisions? It's impossible. I mean, I, I don't know how you do that either. You don't. I mean, I mean you, you, use you, use, you use the emotions, exactly. That's, 
Um, it, I understand you want to look at things objectively, but I'm not sure there's anything like objective um, in the world, really. I mean, I think you want to make sure that you're making decisions. You know, we all look at the world through a filter and only sometimes the problem we live in right now is this bubble where we're only seeing things that fit into our preconceived ideas. So sometimes it helps to kind of step back and, and say, am I making this decision based on all my preconceptions? Um, or should I be looking at this a different way? I mean, I always try to put myself in the other person's perspective, but ultimately making making decisions is probably the hardest thing in the world right now, especially if it if it's easy to it's easy to go with the flow and not ruffle anyone's feathers. And it would have been easy just to stay with the designer on the Australia book and not fire him. Um, it would have been easier, but I mean, my life would have been totally different and it would have been easier to walk away when this woman left me a child in her will that legally didn't mean anything. Um, so I don't know. I mean, when I look back, I guess I've been able to make tough decisions, but at the time, it's like I have a knot in my stomach and I can't sleep for days. Um, so I'm not good at it. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's really good at it. Well, but it sounds like that's the key. You're willing to put yourself in situations or stay in a situation that is really uncomfortable, but you're looking to do the right thing, to make the fabulous product, to raise the <laughs> child, to all of those things that are right and good. We are totally out of time, but I've got one final question for you. Now what? Your career, your life. Um you know, the two things. One is um, I bought the rights to a science fiction book that was my favorite book as a child called Tunnel in the Sky by Robert Heinlein, one of the best, one of the most celebrated science fiction writers. And it's a group of teenagers who get stranded on a planet during their graduation exercise. A little bit like Lost, you know, uh, and those things. But it's actually an up, it's, a, it's a positive look at how these children create their own civilization. Um, and they came unprepared. They thought they were going for a two-day, you know, uh, graduation exercise. And it's, it's always been one of my favorite books. And the, the second thing I'm working on is a ten-part series uh, based on a book I, I did with my wife Jennifer Irwitt called "The Good Fight: America's Ongoing Struggle for Justice," about the history of social justice in America. And the premise is: Would you rather be a um, hundred years ago or today if you're a woman or black or Jewish or Muslim or disabled or gay? or Latino American or Native American, and looking through the eyes of photographers over 100 years of the astounding progress that's been made in America. We always hear about how bad things are, and that we have a lot of progress still to make. But when you realize how bad things were 100 years ago, you definitely want to be in 2022 and not, uh, you know, 1922. Absolutely. So. Thank you so much for sharing your incredible life story and beautiful insights that I think we can all use in living our own dreams um, and doing what we love against all odds. It's fun to see you again. It's an honor to be on your show. Thanks, CJ. Thank you so much. Well, it's happened again. You have squandered another perfectly good hour listening <laughs> to Job Talk. Thank you to our esteemed guest, Rick Smolin, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, Rick. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.